Good morning. If you could open your Bible to Matthew chapter 8, we're going to be looking at four, four short verses. Um, verses 1 through 4, Matthew chapter 8. Um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 says, When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Okay, well that's what the word says. So, our immune system, as many of you are aware, is designed to fight off infection, you know, uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, stuff of that uh, sort. And unfortunately, sometimes infections uh, become too strong and our bodies need a little bit of, of help fighting them off. And before the discovery of penicillin, there was really no such a thing as a small infection or as a, as a routine in, in, in infection as today you would, you would have. Before the, the World War I, the first war, 90% uh, of the children that uh, contracted bacterial meningitis died. And those who survived uh, ended up suffering from very severe and lasting disabilities, from blindness to uh, problems with their um, uh, development. Uh, other uh, diseases like, or conditions like uh, strep throat was on occasion uh, fatal. That, that's not the case anymore. Uh, ear infections would sometimes uh, travel to the brain, and obviously that is a, a big problem. And there were other situations like tuberculosis or pneumonia or whooping cough that led to a very serious illness, including death. So as I was saying, today things are different. The rapid advance in modern medicine has significantly reduced human death rate. And while science has not been able to discover a cure for every single disease that we know of, uh, we still have uh, made great advancements in curing a good deal of, of other uh, sicknesses and infections. But, as I was saying, uh, there are some that we still have not found a cure for. You, you, you uh, fill in the blank. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about here. Today we're going to be talking about a disease for which we have no cure. It's a disease that affects the entire human race and every person, every person has it. Uh, modern medicine, technology, our ability and ingenuity has no offer, uh, uh, has no cure for it. We, we do not know how to cure this, and this is, this is sin, okay? And that's what we're gonna be dealing with here today. So in the first verse of our section here says that Jesus came down from the mountain and large crowds followed him. This mountain that is described here is most likely the mountain that the Lord climbed to teach the Sermon on the Mount. We do not know exactly the location of this place, but we assume that it ha this happened somewhere in the countryside on the way back from the hills to Capernaum. And the reason I say this is because lepers were not allowed uh, to live in towns or villages. So due to their condition, they were forced to live in colonies outside from camp, outside from the city walls, and they were supposed to stay away from society. So it is very likely that at this particular moment when this uh, event is occurring, Jesus was far enough from the crowd that the leper was actually able to approach him. Uh, and the reason I say this is because if the crowd had been near to him, uh, they would not have tolerated his presence among them. They would uh, immediately have said something to, you know, for, for him to, to go away. And, this conclusion seems validated in, in verse 4 when Jesus prohibits the leper from telling others about his healing. So if this healing had occurred in front of a large crowd, 
with a lot of witnesses, there would have been no reason for the Lord to keep, to ask him, or command him to keep his cleansing secret. So, so this is just a reasonable assumption. Again, we, we really don't know that this is what happened, but based on the background knowledge that we have, we can make this assumption. The issue here is that Matthew did not consider it necessary to explain these details, and perhaps the reason is because these details are irrelevant to the point that he's making in the section. So that's, that's first, uh, the first verse. But what Matthew did say is that when Jesus came down from the mountain, there were lar large crowds following him. So at this point, many people had heard of and perhaps witnessed the healings that Jesus performed. And no doubt, these miracles that he was performing made a deep impression in these people, so much so that large crowds were following him. The sad part of this is that this did not mean that all these people following him around were his disciples. These large crowds were composed primarily of curious people who were there to listen to what Jesus had to say, and they wanted to watch what he was going to do, but they didn't actually believe in him as their personal savior. Um, they didn't believe that he was the Messiah that God had promised to send. So these people were not interested in becoming his disciples or believing in him or trusting or having faith in him. They were just simply there for the show. They had FOMO, fear of missing out. They just want to be involved and see what's happening here. They're curious. So, so the point that Matthew is making here with the large crowd is that a lot of people knew about him. A lot of people wanted to see what was happening. And tragically, things have not changed much in this regard because today, across America, we have people who attend church services for reasons other than actually hearing the gospel proclaimed and learning from it in order to apply it to their lives. And this phenomenon can be clearly seen in very large churches where the attendance to the services is in the thousands. However, this phenomenon can also be seen in smaller churches. So I would say practically in any church, but as I was saying, it's more visible in, in, in larger churches. Many of us have heard, at least I have, or maybe some have met, of people who go to church on Sunday out of, out of duty, out of uh, mere habit. This is something that they grew up doing and they, that this is just what they do. Um, Church may be the place for some where, where they see their families, where they meet with their friends, where they socialize. Others may be there to network because, you know, this is good for, for business. Um, others are simply there to keep their children occupied for an hour or two while they're just, you know, taking a break from, from having to be with their kids. Uh, others may attend there because it's a requirement to attend a particular school or to belong to a certain organization. Um, some others just want to be there because it gives the appearance that you know you have piety and trustworthiness and as i was saying this is good for my business this is personally good for me so i need to be part of a church so that other people might have a good impression of me and yet others may be there just to be entertained you know the church is comfortable and modern the coffee is free the music is loud and then the preacher is eloquent and funny and he makes me feel good about myself so i just i just go to church so whatever the reason is, just as it was before, there are many people who know about Jesus and they gravitate toward him and his people, but there are a few who actually know him. There are a few who walk close to him, few who have a personal relationship with him. Therefore, rather than pointing the finger at those people over there and those people over there, what we need to do is to make sure that we are actually walking with the Lord as his disciples, because God is the only one who can see their hearts. So we cannot assume that a large crowd means all believers, but at the same time, we cannot assume that a large crowd means non-believers. God is the one who sees the heart and he's going to make that determination. He is the only one that can separate and he will separate the goats from the sheep. So what we must do is we need to do, as my wife always tells my kids, you worry about yourself. You make sure that you believe in the Lord, that you have a relationship with him, and once you do, you start pointing other people 
to the Lord. So we need to know him rather than just know about him. Now back in our text, in verse 2, there suddenly, out of nowhere, a leper came to him, meaning Jesus, and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So in order to explain this verse, it is important for us to understand what leprosy is and what leprosy does to our bodies. Leprosy is called Hansen's disease, and, and, and that's how we know it today by this name. And, and we probably, this was probably one of the most feared diseases of the ancient world. Now today, things are different because 90% of the population is immune to the disease. And even though it cannot be cured, we can still keep it under control with medication. But they didn't have that luxury before. So before it was serious business. The main issue then with uh, leprosy is that it affects the nerves. And this causes loss of feeling or sensation. Now, if, uh, if you're getting older, like all of us are, you might think, well, you know what, not being able to feel pain is really not a bad thing, okay? There are some, some days where I wish I didn't feel the pain, but, but, the, but this is not a good thing. This is serious business because pain is like an alarm system that tells us that there's something wrong. It indicates that, that something needs to be addressed. Pain is there to prevent us from getting hurt or for, uh, uh, from incurring in further injury. So for example, if you're working with power tools and, or, or a sharp object, uh, uh, you're unable to feel pain in your hands and, and you could be severing your finger without even knowing it. And this, this is you know, something that does happen. So if you're able to feel pain, you would be able to stop immediately at the first sign of, of, of pain. So this is a very serious issue. Feeling no pain is extremely dangerous as we will see later on. This is the problem when you had in the war when, when men had uh, frostbite in, on their limbs and they were trying to, you know, rewarm their limbs and, and they were getting burned and they could not, they didn't know it because they could not feel the pain and now they made the matter worse. That's, that's the situation here. Now leprosy also produces painless uh, lumps and ulcers primarily on the face and your hands and your feet. And these ulcers would grow and they would rot the flesh eventually leading to the loss of limbs. And uh, as if this was not bad enough already, leprosy also affects the bones, it affects internal organs, it distorts the voice, it produces muscle weakness and even paralysis, especially on your hands and feet. It also produces eye problems that could lead to blindness, and it's, it also produces loss, of, loss and discoloration of your facial uh, hair. And this, you know, this is also uh, can make you lose your nose. It also affects the nose. So it's, it's a disfigurement of, of your face and your body. And all these symptoms, as I was saying, not only deformed the human body, it devastated the life of those who, who had it because it made them look like monsters. And as you can imagine, if they look and they sound horrible, I was saying that it also rots the flesh, so, so their smell was also very unpleasant. This made people, this made lepers repulsive to others. And that's the seriousness of this disease. So in order to protect people from this terrible disease, Moses gave, gave very strict and specific rules regarding to leprosy in Leviticus chapter 13. Those who were suspected of having this disease would be brought to the priest and the priest would have, you know, conduct an examination. And if the priest determined that this person indeed suffered from leprosy, he or she would have their, their, their clothes torn, they had to uncover their heads, and they had to wear a cover on, on their mouths. And all these things would make lepers, you know, highly visible. I mean, when you saw these torn clothes with uncovered face and, a, you know, face mask, you knew a leper right from, you know, from the very beginning and from a distance. So then, whenever these poor people were walking around on the streets, when they were moving from one place to another, they had the duty to be screaming, unclean, unclean, basically saying, like, hey, stay away from me. And, and that would, you know, keep people away from them. Uh, 
So this is, this is not only devastating, it's also humiliating. And due to their condition and the high risk of contagion, as I was saying before, they had to live alone outside of the city or the town in these camps, especially for them, uh, um, away from society. So the other issue with leprosy is that they make, it made people ceremonially unclean, and they would remain unclean for as long as they were sick. But the problem is that they didn't have a cure for it, so basically this was you know, unclean until the end of their days. So needless to say, this disease turned lepers into outcasts because they were completely cut off, not only from society, but also from religious activity. They were completely out of everything, away, separated, ostracized. So it was devastating for them. But this prohibition, as we can see here, did not stop this man from coming to Jesus. As I already mentioned, the law forbade this man from approaching or having physical contact with other people. If the leper got close, just a little bit close to a healthy person, the leper could be stoned to death. I mean, there were serious consequences for, for, for crossing this line. Therefore, if the leper wanted to make a request from Jesus, he had to make it at a distance. He had, had, kind of had to shout it to him. But here we read that the leper came to Jesus. Now, something that is important to mention here is that while Matthew describes this man just as a leper, uh, Mark and Luke describe this same man as full of leprosy, meaning that this poor man was suffering from the most severe symptoms of leprosy. So the damage to the nerves, to the bones, and to the flesh would have made this man right here extremely hard, it would have made it extremely hard for this guy to move around. Okay, think about the worst uh, uh, deformity, loss of limbs. I mean, he's the whole package, the unfortunate whole package. And in all livelihood, li likelihood, when, when he walked, he had to be stumbling to get there. And this, this uh, undoubtedly, he also had you know, uh, uh, problems to, to speak. His, his voice must have been very distorted because the damage to the internal, internal organs, uh, including the vocal cords. So this man had not been able to feel any physical pain for a while, and most definitely was in extreme emotional and spiritual pain. That's the picture that we have, just in that short uh, uh, phrase, full of leprosy. That's what we can gather from this man. This man is in extreme suffering, even though he cannot feel the pain. So he was slowly and cruelly dying, rotting away, from the inside and the outside, completely alone. That's the picture that we have. So he was alone, and he was helpless, and he was hopeless. But that's until Jesus came into the picture. Despite his extremely precarious condition, this poor sick man comes to Jesus because he was confident, not only that Jesus had the power to heal him, but he was also confident that Jesus would have compassion on him. The leper knew that Jesus would not stone him to death as other people would do promptly and without hesitation. The leper had no reason to be afraid of Jesus, therefore he approached him directly and confidently. And once in his presence, the leper bowed before Jesus. Now here it is important for us to look at this uh, Greek verb, um, that is used to, to describe the bowing down, the verb is prosecune, because it reveals what the leper thought about Jesus. Prosecune is translated in my NASB as bow down, and the verb literally means to prostrate oneself. It also can be translated as to kneel down before someone or to worship. Some of you might have the uh, King James Version that says worship. So the idea that is expressed here is, is, is of a person's complete dependence uh, on or a complete submission to a higher authority of figure. Therefore, uh, uh, the clear way, perhaps, uh, to translate this is as the King James says that the leper came and worshiped Jesus. Now, this verb then indicates that uh, uh, this man, by God's grace, had come to the realization that Jesus is God, otherwise he wouldn't be worshiping him. You don't just worship random people. They know this. We know that. 
So he comes to Jesus knowing that he is God. Therefore, he worships him. Who else would have the power and the authority to perform the miracles that Jesus performed? Well, only God himself. Therefore, the leopard comes to Jesus with the utmost reverence. He kneels before him in an act of worship, in a demonstration of total dependence and submission to him because he is the Lord and he rightfully calls him Lord. So this leper knew who he was addressing. He knew who he was talking to. And even though the leopard was confident that Jesus had the power and the ability to heal, the leper did not dare to make any presumptions. They know he did not make any assumptions of what Jesus was willing to do. So the leper was humble enough to recognize that he had no right to ask anything from Jesus. The leper knew that he was in absolutely no position whatsoever to make any demands from Jesus, and also that Jesus had no obligation to even listen to what he had to say. That is very clear to him. So this man understood and recognized that the Lord is sovereign. He will do whatever he wants. Therefore, he says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. In other words, the leper knew that Jesus had the power to heal because Jesus is God. However, he also understood that he would be healed only if that was what the Lord desired. And this to me is remarkable because the implication here is that the leper was willing to accept whatever God decided. And if you think about it, this is a different, difficult position. Would you be willing to accept whatever the Lord wants for your life? I have trouble thinking about the scenarios, but there are many that I'm very hesitant to say that I would because I probably wouldn't. But the leopard is showing us that he was, no matter what, willing to submit to whatever God ordained. That's why I was saying that is remarkable. One commentator said that the leopard came with confidence because he believed that Jesus was compassionate. He came with reverence because he believed that Jesus was God. He came with humility because he believed that Jesus was sovereign. And he came with faith because he believed Jesus had the power to heal him. So this faith, this humility, this confidence and reverence toward the Lord Jesus is completely unattainable apart from grace. This man could not have, have reasoned his, his way into this knowledge, into this faith. Jesus said in, in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And this is exactly what we have here. The Holy Spirit had been working on this leopard's heart before this encounter with the Lord Jesus. It is God who's leading this man to come to his son with reverence and confidence and worship. It is the Father who's drawing the leper. Then in verse 3, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Now, there are two things that I need to mention here. First of all, Jesus did not need to touch the leper in order to cure him. I mean, he did not need to make contact. Second of all, in Judaism, there, there was dozens of possible defilements, and of all the defilements that they had, the worst of them was having contact with a dead body. But the second worst was actually having contact with a leper. So that's why I was saying, you know, this, this situation with the leper was, was a bad one. This is, this is not good. In fact, in Leviticus chapter, three, chapter 5, verse 3, there's an explicit uh, uh, um, prohibition from anyone touching an unclean person, such as a leper, because that would make that other person unclean as well. So this is serious business, okay? Not only for the leper, but for everybody involved. That, this is why you didn't want to be around them. This is why they had to, to scream unclean, unclean, so that you don't run into them by accident. And then all of a sudden, you are unclean as well. So the question here is, why did Jesus then touch this man? If he didn't need to, if he can just speak, 
And if the law forbids it, why is he doing this? Well, Jesus was not only demonstrating his power and his goodness, he was also demonstrating his willingness to save and his compassion for sinners. That's probably one of the most important things, his compassion. As I already mentioned, lepers were stigmatized and completely cut off from society. They were totally isolated. No one would even think about coming within 10 feet from these people. I mean, that was just the reality. Not even their mom would come, come close to this man. That This is how serious it is. So who knows how long had it been since this leper had felt the warm embrace of a loved one. You know, if you are a father here today, you know, sometimes we take for granted the hugs and the kisses of our children, of our wives, our husbands, our grandkids. It's just, just, just hugs, this is incidental. But this man had no such privilege. Who knows how much suffering has this man endured in his condition, not being able to feel you know, warmth of other people, the company, just a conversation, just be with one another, sitting next to each other with a friend. He didn't have that. We don't know for how long, but Jesus knew. And an incredible act of kindness and compassion, it says here that the Lord stretches out his hand and touches him and says, I am willing. This is just marvelous how he condescended to us. So Jesus welcomes this man into his presence. He welcomes one who was unwelcome everywhere. Jesus received the outcast of outcasts. He touched one whom no one dared to come even close to, much less touch. Jesus did what no one else could do. He touched the leper and he made him clean. We don't have a cure for leprosy. And Jesus, just with a touch, he cleansed him. Matthew tells us that this effect of the contact with the leopard was immediate, instantly. Unlike some modern medical treatments that begin to make effect after a period of time, let's say if you have strep throat, you know, you feel awful, you take a pill and it, it doesn't work immediately. It takes a few hours for it to start making effect. And then there's a, there's a period you know, for the, for the treatment to work. But the leopard was completely cured and restored at the very instant that Jesus laid his hand on him. So there, there, there would have been no evidence whatsoever that this man had ever, such, uh, have ever suffered from such a terrible disease. If we had a, a problem, my son broke one of his arms some time ago. And, you know, he went through surgery and all this thing, and now he's fully recovered. But when he extends his arm, you can tell that there's you know, a little bit of crookedness there. there. There's evidence that he had that. Um, you know, I cut my finger a while ago, and now it's fully healed, but, but I still have the scar. This man had no evidence whatsoever that he had ever suffered such a terrible disease. He was whole again. He was completely clean. So this was a true an actual miracle. Now, some of you may be wondering about what I had said about Leviticus chapter three, 5, verse 3, and you would be wondering, well, did Jesus become unclean when he touched this person? Because it says that if you touch an unclean person, then you become unclean yourself. Well, absolutely not. Jesus didn't become unclean because the Lord cannot be defiled. And far from being, becoming unclean, Jesus made the, clean, the unclean clean. That's it. Then in verse 4, Jesus sends the man to show the priest that he was cured so that he could be now restored to society as a clean person according to Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. So Jesus says to the leopard, See that you tell no one, but go. Show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So Jesus did not want people to believe that he was just a miracle worker or that he was just this political uh, 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 activist or this political uh, uh, leader that was there to at some point, you know, uh, lead a revolt that was going to overthrow the Romans because remember that, that at that time, the Romans were occupying uh, Israel. 
This is not who the Lord is. So Jesus firmly prohibits this man from telling others about his miraculous cure. And instead, the man was supposed to go and see the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So according to Leviticus chapter 14, this offering that we're seeing here required bringing two birds, two clean birds, and one of them was going to be killed. And then uh, uh, this had to be done on the running water. And then the bird that was alive, with, uh, along with uh, some cedar and a scarlet string and hyssop, they were dipped in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And then the priest would sprinkle the former leper um, seven times. And then after all this whole ritual, the former leper was uh, now ceremonially clean again. And then the priest would let this bird that was used for the ceremony that was, you know, the bird was alive, he would let, set him free on an open field. So this ceremony represents our salvation. The water mixed with the blood represents the cleansing of guilt and the contamination of sin. And then the bird that is set, that is being set free uh, represents the sin that has been paid for by the shedding of blood from the other bird that was a substitute. So in other words, this bird that died on behalf of the sinner is the one who bore the punishment on the leper's behalf. And then the bird that flew away also represents the former leper's freedom from sin. This is, a, this is a picture of our salvation. And as you start putting one and one together, you see how this is speaking about the Lord. Now, this sacrifice could only be offered in the temple in Jerusalem, which meant that this man had a long journey ahead of him. I mean, even if he was running, he would still have a ways to go to, to the temple. And also, according to Leviticus chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, this ritual took eight days to complete. It's not just as, you know, as quick as I just mentioned it to you. This is just for illustration purposes, but the whole thing took eight, year, um, eight, eight days. So there was really no time to, to lose. This man had to rejoin society as soon as possible, and he could not do that until the whole ceremony was complete. But Jesus' purpose, is, purpose was not merely to restore this man to society. Through this, through this miracle, Jesus was demonstrating to the religious authorities, I am the Messiah. I am here. I'm letting you know. This is to demonstrate to you that I am here now. Now, that's the, that, that's the, those are the four, the first four verses. This is what's happening so far. And some of you may be thinking, well, okay, so that's a great story. We got it. But how does that have to do anything with me because I'm not a leper? So what's the deal there? Well, I'm gonna to explain to you in the scriptures, Specifically in the New Testament, leprosy serves as a very graphic illustration of sin and guilt. And just like leprosy, sin affects us, all of us, no matter who you are. It affects us inwardly and it affects us outwardly. And just like leprosy, sin produces blindness, it makes us numb, it makes us insensitive to the warnings of our conscience. So now you start getting the picture. Like leprosy, sin disfigures and ultimately destroys us. Leprosy makes us repulsive and it separates us. This is what happened with Adam and Eve when they were living in the garden. They were living in the garden and God had fellowship with them. God would go and talk to them. God would go and see them and they were roaming around. But when they fell, things changed. And then as a consequence, what did happen to them? Well, they had to go out of the garden. You can no longer be in the presence of God because God is holy and he cannot be in the presence of sin. So Adam and Eve had to, had to go. They were expelled from the garden and then the sword of fire and the cherubim are placed at the east entrance so that they could not come back. Now there's this chasm between them and there's nothing that they can do to bridge it. And that's what's happening here with us. You know, sin separates us from God. And there's no way that we can bridge that gap. 
So just like leprosy separates us, leprosy separates us from fellow man, but sin separates us from the holy God. And there is nothing that we can do about it. We cannot cure that disease. There's nothing that we can do to cure our sin. There's nothing that we can do to make amends with the Father. We are separated without remedy. But Jesus is the one who cured that, sin, that, that uh, disease. He is the one that brings us together to the Lord. So if you're here and you have not believed in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are full not of leprosy, but of sin. You're spiritually dead and you're repulsive to the eyes of the holy God. Your sin separates you from God and you will remain away from him for as long as you remain in your sins. Sin cannot be cured, as I was saying, by any man. But this is the good thing. Jesus was not a mere man. He is God incarnate. And like the bird described in Leviticus 14, Jesus Christ took our place at the cross. He shed his blood to atone for our sins. He bore the wrath of God on our behalf. He paid the debt that we could never repay. And with his death and resurrection, he made us alive in him and dead to sin. That's what the Lord did. That's the remarkable thing of all this. This is what this passage is talking about. This is who Jesus is. He came and he's saying, I am the Messiah. I am the cure to this leprosy that you cannot cure. I am here to bring you back where you belong, which is in the presence of God. Those who trust in Christ for their salvation are adopted into God's family. And we now become fellow heirs with Christ. And the encouraging thing is this, there is no sinner that is beyond saving. There is no sin too big or too heinous, too bad that it cannot be paid by the blood of Christ. So if you're here without Christ, you need to come to him now and let this be the day of your salvation. And then for those of us who are here and we have believed, it is good for us to remember what it took to reconcile us to the Father. I heard one time some dear man talking about the Lord's Supper and how he, he didn't come because it's always the same thing. It's always the same passages. And if you think about it, I have said this many times. I'm always talking about Christ and talking about Christ and that's what he did and we're separated. But see, the thing is this, we are forgetful. We forget easily, especially when things are going well, which thankfully for a lot of us, they are. We need to be reminded. We need to know what was what it took for us to come back to the fellowship with God. So we must rejoice in the forgiveness and the freedom that we have received from Christ. And in a moment, we're going to remember the Lord and what he did. And that has to bring joy to our hearts. So we must say, to God be all glory forever and ever. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the reminder of the eternal cost that was paid for our salvation. Lord, we thank you because we are um, unworthy of this gift, but you decided to do it because you are sovereign, and for that we thank you. Lord, would you allow us to remember uh, that we were bought at a price, that we are not our own, that everything we have we receive from your hands. So Lord, allow us to be thankful every day of our lives that we would remember that your son took our place on the cross to pay the debt that we couldn't. And if there's anyone, Lord, that has not yet come to know your son, would you make this the day of their salvation? Seize their hearts, Lord, and change it into a heart of flesh that they may be able to follow your son, believe in his word, obey his commandments, and be restored to the sweet fellowship that we have with him and with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.